Welcome to Andy Staples on three. A lot of news today in the world of college football. Just this afternoon, it comes down. The state of Iowa gambling investigation has ensnared seven more players. Four from Iowa State, three current or former Iowa Hawkeyes. They've been charged with tampering with records, which basically is concealing your identity when placing bets. And some of these are wild. So the headliner of this probably is, is Jarrell Brock, who is Iowa State's leading rusher from last year. He's been held out of practice so far this year for undisclosed reasons, which I think we know what the reasons are now. Uh, but the the craziest one is Isaiah Lee, a defensive tackle from Iowa State. So according to the court records obtained by the Des Moines Register, Isaiah Lee placed a money line wager on the Texas Iowa State game in 2021. Now, for those who don't gamble, what the money line is, is who do you think is going to win? There's no point spread. You say, I think Team X is going to win. If Team X is the favorite, you can win less. If Team X is the underdog, you can win more. So he placed a bet on Texas to beat Iowa State in a game in which he played. Iowa State won the game 30 to 7, guys. So the next time I incorrectly predict a football game and you write to me on Twitter or you come into the comments here and say you should be fired because you incorrectly predicted the result of that football game, guys, this man was in practice all week and he bet on Texas and Iowa State won. How am I, how am I supposed to compete if he can't even win that bet? Come on. But seriously, that is a terrible beat right there. And in a lot of these cases, you've got guys betting in games that they either played in or were dressed for or are part of the team for. Guys, at this point, you're just failing an intelligence test. Like, don't bet on your own games. I am not one of those people who's going to say college athletes shouldn't gamble at all. Like, I, I'm, I can't say that. We're going to advertise gambling places here. We're going to talk about it a lot. We're going to talk about point spreads, totals. God knows when we talk about IO, we're going to, we're going to talk about over-unders. So I'm never going to say they should be banned from gambling completely. But I do understand why they should be banned from gambling on their own sport. That's the one thing that you've got to have really hard and fast rules about. You've got to say you can never gamble on your own sport because for the viewers to feel like, the sport is on the up and up. They can't think anybody's fixing the games. And if people have money on the games, then they're going to be worried about it. And I mean, if you look at the, the numbers on Lee, 115 bets for over $885. This is very small stakes here. It doesn't matter, though. It's probably probably the end of his career at this point. And also, how do you face the guys in the locker room if they know you bet against them? That's rough. That is really really rough but i hope this is the lesson i hope other players are watching and like when we talked to dan what's the last week he said oh no no don't don't let them gamble at all they don't need to be gam listen i don't care if they're putting money on nba games probably shouldn't be betting on any college sports because they're around other college athletes might potentially have an effect on the outcome but never bet on your own sport on your own team this is not a complicated concept. This is not new information. They, they have been putting that don't bet on it poster in the locker room for years and years and years and years. Tyler Smith says, as an ISU fan, I hope this scares the athletes from doing any of this, but I'm afraid it's gonna or already happened ever. I guarantee you, Tyler, it's happened in other places. And, and I realize people think we're probably piling on Iowa and Iowa State here. That's the state that is investigating it now. The state of Iowa is investigating this. I imagine there will be other states where sports wagering is legal that will have their own investigations. And we, we've heard either anecdotally or even in some of those surveys the NCAA does that a lot of college athletes are gambling. So we, we know that. A lot of college students are gambling, period. But again, if you bet on your own sport and your own team, you are simply failing an intelligence test. It's not that hard. And for God's sake, don't bet the money line against your own team. But again, I don't want to hear it when you get mad at me because I predicted the wrong result in the football game. If a guy could be in every practice, 
the week his team goes and kicks the crap out of Texas and think Texas is going to win, what hope do the rest of us have? I've always said 18 to 22-year-olds are a wildly unpredictable bunch, and they are. And so I, I will continue to believe that large groups of 18 to 22-year-olds are wildly unpredictable. And I think this is just more evidence of that. In other news, better news for a couple of teams. Five star plus. That's just something we do it on three. We don't just have five stars. We have five star plus. Five star plus edge rusher. Collins, Collins Simmons from Duncanville, Texas. Announced his commitment. Did a little fake out. Little fake out with the LSU hat if you're watching the video. But then he throws up the Longhorns hat. He's going to Texas. So this is the first time in a long time that the number one edge rusher in the country is committed to Texas. And th there has been an uptick in recruiting under Steve Sarkeesian. I know what you're going to say. The Taylor and the Mac Brown era, Charlie Strong era, Tom Herman era, they were getting highly ranked players. They were. You're right. But – they weren't necessarily getting them at the, the primary pr prestige positions, the ones that, that you would have at the top of your NFL draft board chart, like the offensive tackle, the edge rusher, that. that. So now they, they did with Quinn Ewers at quarterback and Arch Manning now with quarterback. But you, you're seeing it more recently on the offensive line, especially that, that class led by Calvin Banks in 2022. But so this is the first time the top-ranked edge rusher in the country has been headed to Texas since 2010, Jackson Jeffcoat. South Carolina's gotten the top-ranked edge rusher twice since then. That was Jadavian Clowney and Jordan Birch, who has since transferred to Oregon. Ohio State's done it a few times. They got – one Bosa brother was, was the number one overall. One was not. Uh, and then uh, Chase Young was, was the number one edge rusher. And then you've got – Alabama has gotten it a bunch of times. Will Anderson actually was the number two in, in one class. But you've got, you know, Texas A&M got Miles Garrett. Oregon got Kayvon Thibodeau. Texas has not been that in that mix. So first time in 13 years that Texas has landed the number one edge rusher prospect in the country. Good luck to Colin Simmons at Texas, assuming he signs there. Remember, uh, we are duty-bound to point out that all – Verbal commitments are non-binding until they sign a national letter of intent in December. Also, Simmons' teammate, Caden Durham, committed today, and he is going to LSU. He looked at Oklahoma. He was looking at Texas A&M, but he becomes the first running back in LSU's class of 2024. Really good pickup for the Tigers. He's also going to run track. This is Brian Kelly getting it done on the recruiting trail. He's a top 100 prospect. This is what LSU needs to do. And, and it's interesting because that position, which always seemed to be a position of depth for LSU, has not been a position of depth of late. So that's another big pickup. But the Texas deal, you have that deep offensive line class. You, you, you're getting the number one edge rusher. That's the type of stuff you've got to do to compete in the SEC. That's what Alabama does. That's what Georgia does. So – it bodes well for Texas. Now you got to do it on the field. I, I will continue to say this over and over and over until I see it. You have to win the games you're supposed to win. This is a year when Texas is going to be favored to win the Big 12. They have a lot of talent on this roster. And I know I, some of you are going to say it again. They've always had highly ranked recruiting classes. But you're going to get used to me on this show explaining stars matter, like my friend Ari Wasserman says. Yes. But I also want to know... How many guys do you have on the way out the door who NFL teams are going to covet? And that's one of those things that Texas has not had that over the last few years. They have that now. They definitely have that now because Kelvin Banks, who's got two more years in college, offensive tackle, he will be coveted by NFL teams. Jatavian Sanders, the tight end, coveted by NFL teams. Xavier Worthy, the receiver, will be coveted by NFL teams. These are the types of people that you got to have if you're going to compete in the SEC. And that's what Texas is trying to do. So we got those commits. Now we got to talk about this Notre Dame thing. I, I sent out a tweet today 
Made a lot of people on the internet mad. It was actually about 50-50. 50% of the people said, well, this is a pretty good idea. 50% of the people said you were the stupidest person who has ever lived on this planet. And I don't understand how you're allowed to take some of the oxygen that should be reserved for smarter people. So here's what happened. Jack Swarbrick, the athletic director of Notre Dame, talked to Heather Dinich from ESPN. And he bemoaned the situation that Cal and Stanford find themselves in. They're without a conference, two of the most prestigious academic institutions, not just in America, but in the world. And he's right about that. It is terrible that they don't have a conference home right now. But my first thought was, you know what? Notre Dame could do something about that. Notre Dame, if it wanted to, could actually form its own conference. And I even threw out an idea. Notre Dame, Cal, Stanford, Army, Air Force, Navy. That gives Notre Dame two of its traditional rivals, Stanford and Navy. Other games that people would tune in and watch, but not... So challenging that Notre Dame can't win them. Leave space, because basically it would replace Notre Dame's ACC scheduling opponent. So leave space for Notre Dame to play USC and to play, like they're playing Ohio State this year, teams like that. It's a win-win. Who loses in that situation? Notre Dame makes a deal again with NBC. It keeps most of the money, but breaks off a bunch for, for everybody else. Army Navy, that game is a massive TV property. It's owned by CBS till 2028, but hey, you can break them at it or start a bidding war between NBC and CBS. Now, I know what you're thinking. You got to have eight teams in every sport to have a conference in the NCAA. Don't throw NCAA rules at me in situations like this. Guess who, the, who makes the rules? The schools. If Notre Dame's like, hey, everybody, you mind if we form our own conference? They'll, they'll make a rule that reduces the number that you need in a conference. And this could be a football-only conference if you want. You could have Cal and Stanford park their other sports in the Pacific Coast Conference, just like BYU did when it was an independent in football. And you can call it something like the Independent Conference. It'd be great. The reason I put this out there, and then I wrote a column about it later, is because I'm tired of the people in charge of college sports saying, this is terrible. This is awful. Everybody's just going for the money. Yeah. Yeah. You all are. We know. But instead of just saying these platitudes, why not actually do something? And that's the difference because all of these people that run college sports say a lot of things and they almost always do the opposite. So if Notre Dame believes so fervently that Cal and Stanford need a conference home, Notre Dame could make them a conference home. Will Notre Dame do that? Absolutely not. And you will never hear Notre Dame must join a conference from me. I hope Notre Dame is never forced into joining a conference. I love the history in the Notre Dame independent story. I think it's really cool that Notre Dame football being blackballed by fielding Yost in the Western Conference, the Proto Big Ten back in 1910, turned Notre Dame the university into what it is now. They had to go play a nationwide schedule. They had to go play Army in 1913, introduce the world of the Ford Pass. They had to go out to USC. They had to go everywhere. That turned a small Catholic school in Northern Indiana into the greatest Catholic university in America. That made them a national name. It increased applications from across the country so they could be more selective with their students. It's really cool that Notre Dame is independent. I love it. And I think what's going to happen as long as there are at-large spots in the college football playoff, especially as many as there are, and with the possibility of conferences consolidating a little bit and maybe some more coming open, Notre Dame doesn't have to join a conference. Notre Dame can sign its deal with NBC, rake in a bunch of money, and yes, NBC will pay Notre Dame a bunch of money because Notre Dame, unlike most schools, moves the meter on television. And you can say what you want. Oh, Big Ten schools in the SEC will just, they need to just say, stop scouting Notre Dame. They're not going to do that. You, know why, you want to know why? Because if you schedule Notre Dame, you fill your stadium and lots of people watch on TV. Everybody wants that. So I'm not going to criticize Notre Dame for staying independent, wanting to stay independent, doing its own thing, doing what's best for Notre Dame. What I'm criticizing is stop saying all of this is so bad when you're doing the same thing that caused all of this other stuff. What caused this 
is schools acting in their own best interest. It was in Oregon and Washington's best interest to go to the Big Ten. It was in USC and UCLA's best interest to go to the Big Ten. It was in Oklahoma and Texas's best interest to go to the SEC. It was in the Big 12 schools' best interest to take the four corner schools from the Pac-12 because they would have been eaten otherwise. So don't just say, well, this is awful and I wish someone would do something. If you can actually do something about it, instead say, sucks for them, but we're going to do what's best for us. And that's what Notre Dame's going to do. And that's fine. But don't say, well, I wish somebody could do something about it. You can, but you're not going to. That's all right. But just say, sucks for them and move on. End of rant. When we come back, we have an interview that I'm very excited for you to see. You may know Biff Pogey from his performance at American Athletic Conference Media Days. It, he got three questions. He got very mad about this. He stormed off. You may know him from the documentary on HBO about the high school that he was coaching and he was essentially funding. You may know him from what he did at Michigan the past couple of years where he was basically the guy behind the guy with Jim Harbaugh. This is one of the most fascinating people in college football. Biff Pogey was a hedge fund manager by day, high school football coach by night, who won multiple Maryland State titles, who built a monster out of a school that had nothing, that he funded basically himself, funded all the scholarships, was feeding all the players, was housing the players, helped them go to college. He's at Charlotte now. He's trying to resurrect that program and bring it into the American Athletic Conference. He's got a bunch of guys that he coached in high school coming with him. It is going to be one of the most fascinating stories in college football this year. So let's hear from Biff Pogey, his cutoff sleeves, and his cigar. We're joined now by Charlotte 49ers head coach Biff Pogey and – I'm so glad that this is this is how we're getting them. We're getting them cigar break after practice, before meetings. The the sleeves are off. The V neck is deep. Coach, how we doing? <laughs> hey Andy, how you doing, man? So I, I have I don't even know where to start with you because you fascinate me completely. Uh, because I, I go back to a career of you know you you play football at Pitt. You're going to be a coach. You're going to be a teacher. Your father-in-law pulls you aside and said, how are you going to take care of my daughter and that baby that you have coming? I guess we can start, start there because that, that's where the Renaissance man piece of you starts. You went in, in, into business with your father-in-law. You end up running a hedge fund. How tough was the pull of the coaching you had to leave behind to do that? Uh, you know, it was hard. I mean, football was a huge part of my life as a kid and a young adult and and then, um, you know, my, my father-in-law uh, was a realist, you know, and a, and a very smart man, MIT Sloan fellow in business. And, of course, you know, he liked me, but he loved his daughter and his, gran his <laughs> grandkids. And was like, okay, buddy, how are we going to get this done? So, um, you know, he, he approached me in a way that was um, interesting. And then he, um, you know, he really – uh, it clicked for me. I was not never a great student at all. I was a terrible student, as a matter of fact, and never had much math. Uh, I'm a horrible math student, but somehow uh, the, the 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 art and the science of investing just clicked for me. And so, um, you know, 37 years later, here we are. But yeah. you you work. You were coaching, you know, once you got that rolling, you, you started coaching, went to your alma mater, Gilman, right. built the, the St. Francis Academy. When did you realize I, I need to be back in football? I need to be around a team. Well, I knew that I never stopped coaching, right? Yeah. Uh, coaching high school was great because you show up at two o'clock and you leave at five and, you know, it's great. Uh, but you know, once my kids grew, grew up, and moved out of the house, went to college. Uh, you know, uh, my old friend Jim Harbaugh called me and uh, said, will you come up and help? And I said, yes. And I went there in 2016, our Orange Bowl year. Uh, my son was a, was a really good player there. And, Henry. Uh, yeah, old Henry. And, um, and then 
at the end of the 16 season, I said, Jim, you know, um, Baltimore's a mess. The city of Baltimore, that's where, where I'm from. Baltimore's a mess. And there's a school there that I think I can, my wife and I really believe we can help. It was getting ready to close. And, uh, and so we went to St. Francis. It was kind of a comprehensive thing at St. Francis. So it was scholarships for kids. It was um, housing. It was hiring math teachers and science teachers and English teachers. It was study hall. Uh, it was tutors. It was very comprehensive. And so we did that and, uh, and uh, as a way to help a community that we grew up in, uh, that I grew up in, um, but, but also to help kids that just really didn't, didn't have, you know, came from tough backgrounds. And mm -hmm. so was the, well, I was there four years, it was incredibly rewarding. Uh, COVID hit, you know, Michigan kind of had a tough 20, 20 year. Jim and I talk all the time anyway, um, like we do now. And, um, and, J and Jim said to me, you know, um, would you consider coming back? And I said, yes, but only if I can, you know, make sure St. Francis is taken care of. St. Francis got taken care of. And I went back to uh, Michigan for 21 and 22. And um, that whole time, by the way, uh, you know, I was involved with my fund, except in um, 16, 21 and 22. And of course, mm -hmm. now, but I have, and, uh, I have other people running it now. It's ex players running it, right? Guys who played for you. Former players. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. That's a, I mean, that's the thing you, you, you seems like every time you talk about what your team can do for someone, you're talking in terms of 20 years from now and how you've got so much proof of concept with that. How much does it help you when you're recruiting players now? Well, I call our recruiting pitch when people, <laughs> kids and their parents come in, I call it the anti recruiting pitch. Um, I said, cause my job is to try to get you not to want to come here. <laughs> because what I tell them is, in my opinion, not all, obviously, but many football coaches are great prevaricators. You know, they, they are great mm -hmm. at looking at a kid and his family and saying, okay, in about 15 seconds, okay, this is what this kid wants to hear and is what his parent or parents want to hear. And they tell you that whether it's true or not. And, and I'm not going to do that. And so what I tell them is, I'm going to um, tell you what I think you need to hear. And so we talk about, we don't even talk about football and recruiting pitch. Um, we start with our vision and the vision page has nothing to do with football. It, our vision is to create men of empathy and faith who will become good fathers, sons, husbands, and members of the community to serve those who are left for, fortunate. That's why we're doing it. And in a, in a few words, we call it building men for others. And, and you know, what, what does that involve? It involves, um, you got to go to school, got to go to class, you got to get an education and not some education and some absurd degree that is not commercial. So we have a mandatory, we put in a really cool, really cool mandatory, um, uh, financial literacy curriculum. 13 weeks they have to take it it's mandatory they absolutely love it and then coupled with that we uh you know charlotte's an unbelievable city for business the banking capital really of the country more fortune 500 1000 companies are moving to charlotte because all the financing is here it's a vibrant vibrant city and though we went around and met a bunch of old friends that we did business with over the years and new friends that we're making and uh, they do an eight-week internship after that financial literacy program. They go down, put their suits on, go downtown, and uh, and and you know they get paid to do it. It's it's a they get a thousand dollars a week for eight weeks. I give them that time to do it instead of doing football because I think it's important for their lives. And you know, the other thing in recruiting we tell them is this: there's only two types of coaches. There's transactional coaches and there's transformational coaches. Transactional coaches care about their next contract, the next bigger job, the you know, TV show, how many wins they have. Transformational coaches are in it for the kids. And the nice thing about me being a little older and also, you know, having had success in business, I don't, I don't care about the next contract. It doesn't. I'm not in it for that. So, I'm in it for them. 
I imagine in, in 19 years at Gilman and then the four at St. Francis where you had college coaches coming in and out all the time, you learn quite a bit about what it takes to be a good college recruiter and what, what not to do. Uh, what did you, what, what are the biggest lessons you took from dealing with coaches over the years? Well, what a really good question, Andy. Um, I learned a lot about what not to do. I also have, you know, four sons that played division one college football. And so I sat in the seat, the parents sit in, mm-hmm. and some of the stories are so fantastic. They're like, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're like the Harry Potter series. They're so enthralling. They're so fantastic. And, and what I learned is this. When you approach a kid who comes into your building, remember this. You're, you are recruiting and coaching a mother's son. And what that means is this. That's the most precious thing in the world to that mother. And I have a wife, and we had those four boys, and... You know, I, I know what it meant to her, and I know how disappointed she was when we found out people weren't, you know, when, the, when, the, when their Pinocchio noses were growing. Mm-hmm. So um, with, the, the major thing is always tell the truth. So you get to Michigan, and, and Jim Harbaugh said one of the most important things you did there was you could tell him the truth and weren't worried about how he was going to react, weren't worried about your job. What was some of the first pieces of advice you gave him when, when you got in there? Well, first of all, Jim is a very unique person. Jim is really intelligent. Jim happens to be a football coach. He loves football. But, but Jim could be anything, right? He could be a physician. He could be a, 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 you know, he could run a hedge fund. He's really smart. And... It's very rare characteristic to have someone who says to you, I want you to tell me what you perceive to be the truth. And, um, and, and so, so Jim was open to it. And, you know, the things that we talked about, I don't want to, to divulge those because they were very personal, but, you know, he, he took my advice, um, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And, uh, and that just made us Everybody in the building better, made me better, made him better, made our assistants better, made our players better. And, and so, you know, I think that's a very important person to have on your staff because what, what, happens, in college, um, what happens in college games, what happens in, co- in college, excuse me, in college, um, can you all move over there, please? Hey, Lou, can you guys move down that side? What happens in college um, – uh, in, in, in college football buildings is the coach, the head coach is like the king. You know, he's like Charles the third, you know, he walks around and everybody genuflects and his ex European history teacher here. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, it, it genuflects and they don't even call him, you know, by their name, they call him coach and everybody in the building says, well, coach said this, well, what coach? Well, it's always the head coach. And so, you know, Jim was not like that. I don't believe in running it that way. And, um, and, and so, you know, yeah, we, we had a really good culture there at Michigan. And we're putting the same culture here at Charlotte. Who's your Biff Pogey? Hmm. Good question. Um, let me keep my cigar to it. No, no problem. Uh, it's John Jacobson. John is the, uh, our assistant head coach. John is a friend of mine. He's 46. I've known John 46 years. We were in high school together at Gilman. And John is a very, was a very successful hedge fund investor. So we, we, we have a lot in common. And uh, as a matter of fact, just this very day, uh, John said to me on the practice field, he said, I, I want to talk to you. I, um, he talked to you privately in your office, and he came up, and it was a, a really hard conversation and a great conversation. Um, and, uh, and he was right. He was absolutely right. So, you know, that's my guy right there. So you've got a, a couple of guys who played for you at St. Francis, uh, Demond Clowney, uh, big wall, big defensive tackle, Jonathan Wallace. And you, you know, you've flipped this roster pretty quickly. What were you looking for when, when you were looking for new players? Because you're, you're going into a new conference. This is, you know, going to the American conference, a completely different era of Charlotte football starting now. 
Yeah, I we have 24 St. Francis kids. Wow. Um, and we have um, 28 kids out of the portal. Uh, that's 52, and we kept 52. Now, that, that was not by design, but that's just how it worked out. With... And um, uh, so can you see me still? Am I still uh, we've lost you. I can hear you, but I can't see you. There, oh, I think you're, there you're back. You're good. Yep. Um, and what I was looking for in the portal were the uh, same thing I was looking for when I hired my coaches. I wanted good men and good kids. And then we we'll, we f- want to find that first, and then we'll figure out about you know who's a good player and that kind of stuff. So I, I do want to thank you for something you said in your your introductory press conference. You uh, you outlined your defense where you said we're going to stop the run when we make you one dimensional and make you throw. We're going to light you up. I appreciate you explaining somewhat of what the defense will look like without saying we're going to be multiple because we know it's not completely a state secret, but uh, you you've imported basically the, the Ravens and Michigan's defense here. How is that going with, with Ryan Osborne at, at DC? He's brilliant. He's young. He works like, yeah, he's a wild man. He works so hard and the kids love him. I mean, you know, we had Mozzie Smith here, uh, came to work with, with, uh, Oz. Um, we had, um, uh, Jesus losing the, uh, Aiden Hutchinson came down. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, players that players that play for him love him, and they love him because he he makes them better. He's honest with them, and he's completely fair with them. So our defense right now is I got to tell you is elite. It is, you know, I stand behind the offense because I don't want to get run over, and um, <laughs> and it is just so disconcerting because there's no leverage on the defense. They're everywhere. They come from every place. You can't run the ball on them. It is like if you're an offensive coach, it'll drive you to start drinking heavily. Well, I cannot wait to see it. I, I now I got to ask you because you you obviously have been very successful at everything you've ever tried. You're you're very, not a lot of steps ahead of most of us. Not so, everything. I haven't been successful in losing all the weight I want to lose, but every, you know, there's a I can, I can, I can help. I, I lost about 62 years ago. So if Good you need, you, me, you. you need a calorie count, buddy, I, you just text me. I'll, uh, Good for you. I'm like I got, I got that. a few people who text me now. Like what's, what's this spoonful of peanut butter? How many calories do I put in? I totally you just, love it. You got to put right. them all in and guilt yourself <laughs> into not eating. So, but, uh, I, th- this, this press conference, the, the American, Athletic Conference Media Days, where you, you, you don't get any more questions, and you say, that's it, three questions? Maybe right, that's because you have us ranked last. That's all what you think of us. <laughs> so that, that, we, we get that message. Thank you. And you say, that's it, three questions? Now, what you did after that got Charlotte football more attention than if you'd had five more questions asked. Were you thinking that in the moment, or were you just pissed that you only got three questions? I plead the fifth. <laughs> uh, it, it was both. I was furious about the three questions. Um, but that's galvanized our football team. Hey, look, we, 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 believe it or not, you know, we can read, and we've seen all the preseason predictions and the you know, the Vegas line of two games and all that nonsense. And, uh, and that just galvanized it. That was the fire in the furnace that made us pure. And I got to tell you something. I've been in a lot of places. I've been, I've been in, God, I don't even I don't know how I can't do the math, but 45 uh, opening, you know, training camps for college, either as a player or a coach. Um, or, or a high school coach. I've never seen anything like this. This is really cool. And I, I don't know how you predict a conference that has this many new members anyway. So it, it seems to be a bit of a fool's errand, but I am glad it's, it's given you guys some motivation. A lot. A lot. Uh, yeah, they are, I would say this, they're beautiful, wonderful kids off the field. I love them to death. I really do. I care so deeply about them. 
But on the field, as I said, I mean, they are bad company. I mean, they are just so grumpy. It is, it is amazing. And so I love it. Well, Biff, thank you so much. Cannot wait to see them actually play on a game day. So uh, this is going to be Andy. fun. Yeah, thank thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Didn't even put out the cigar. That was amazing. I, I will do a Biff Pogey interview every day if possible. Uh, we, we may have a lot more Charlotte updates on this show because I cannot wait to see what that guy does. It is so exciting. And he, he's just, he's different. I, I appreciate different. I appreciate when you come from a different place and a different background. And it, it's true that he, when he got to Michigan the second time around, that what Jim Harbaugh asked him to do was kind of what you'd be asked to do as a, as a turnaround consultant in the corporate world. You know, go find our weak points, figure out what we need to do. And, and one of the things that he wound up doing was telling Jim Harbaugh, hey, have a lighter hand with the offense. You know, you don't have to, to decide everything right now. You don't have to do every single thing. Be more of a CEO. And it's, it's worked. I mean, the, the culture they have at Michigan is fantastic now. And they've won two Big Ten titles in a row. So Biff Pogge is going to bring that to Charlotte. And if you haven't watched the HBO documentary, The Price of Winning, which is about his St. Francis team, you should watch that. It's four episodes. It was It's just fascinating. You see a lot about uh, Blake Corum is on that team, the, the Michigan running back. And then he mentioned he's got over 20 guys from that program that, that – basically transferred to come play for him. You know, there, there were some guys who signed with power five schools that maybe didn't find the starring role they wanted there. And then other guys who kind of bounced around. So I, it is a new roster. So I don't, again, the, the, the picking of the, the American conference and how it's going to all play out. I have no idea. And I don't think anybody else does either because the memberships change so much. I mean, you can, you can probably feel like Tulane, should feel fairly comfortable being picked to win. They won it last year. They brought a lot of guys back, but the, the new teams coming in, I mean, and you got Trent Dilfer at UAB coming in there too. So that's going to be a, a really fascinating story to follow along, see how that goes. I think Biff Pogey knows what he's doing though. He's, he's been very successful again at almost everything he's done. So Watch that documentary if you hadn't. And speaking of documentaries, the big news in, in documentary world college football is Netflix has a Johnny Football documentary out. And I know a bunch of you have already seen it. I'm sure some of you haven't seen it yet. Don't worry. Even if you haven't seen it, this interview with Billy Lucci is not going to spoil too much for you. But I do urge everybody to watch it. If you, if you enjoyed watching Johnny Football play in college or you just enjoyed the circus around him and uh, or even enjoyed watching him flame out in the NFL, you will learn a lot about the guy and about what was going on behind the scenes. It, it was it was very open. Johnny was very open. His former agent, Eric Burkhart, was very open. Uncle Nate, who was Johnny's friend slash handler slash get it done guy, he was very open. Johnny's parents, Johnny's sister. And this guy, Billy Lucci from Texags.com, Big time character in the Johnny football documentary. Billy joined us to talk about making that documentary, about what Johnny thought about it and what they left out of it. If you're a college football fan, you have probably already watched the Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix or you're about to watch it. We're joined now by one of the stars of that documentary, Billy Lucci from Texags, who the glow up. <laughs> of the old clips of you versus you in your office in that doc. I mean, you turned into like a, a, a country music singer songwriter before our very eyes. Like fine wine, Andy, as I like to say. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, nobody ever told me I looked like that. And I'm sure 10 years <laughs> from now, I'll look back at what I look like in that documentary and go, damn it, what was I doing? But I'll take that versus the other one. I have a... a really close friend of mine and uh i know the last time i sat down with you i was at, actually at her wedding in in colorado and she's also my stylist if, ah. you know, and i do i know right now i'm just basic but i do for, you know when i need her um she's great and 
she, you know, I, she's good enough that I drive to Dallas every couple of weeks to go buy clothes. And, and so she was messing with me about it. Uh, just how that, that was pre Ashley styling me. And then that was after the fact. And well, so, you know, big shouts to Ashley. If you're in the DFW right. area and you need, you need styling. That's, that's where you go. go so let, let's, you. let's talk about this documentary because I was shocked. Now you've always been an open book. You, you always tell great stories, but I was shocked Back at how at open you. Johnny was, Uncle Nate was, Eric Burkhart, the agent who wound up firing Johnny. Like, they just open book on this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have told you that Nate would have been good. I would have told you that Johnny, uh, when he wants to open up, there are a few people that will tell a story like Johnny and, and, and he's just got so many of them that they're, that are real, you know, like he did more and he's done more in the last 10 years. And, you know, in terms of like salacious, just jaw drop, your jaw drops on a story than probably most people, you know, 10 people added up in a lifetime would do. Um, Burkhart surprised me and pleasant surprise made me laugh. I've always loved EB. I've known him since, you know, he was, kind of first getting into the game, I, I sat there and felt for him when he was dealing with <laughs> the circus that was Johnny. Um, and I thought he did a good job of kind of putting that into words in the doc. And, and yeah, he had a glow up too, by the way. You see from when he was at Tech with Cliff and <laughs> and then uh, now they're with, you know, Rock Nation and Jay-Z and he's got that jacket on. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let, if I was country singer, you know, Burkhart was like some – you know, pop guy. Going oh yeah. He's, he's, he's court. a pop star, but the, yep. so you had told me the story of Johnny's private workout with the Browns years ago. And to he hear that fleshed out by Burkhart, cause you, you lived it from the, the, <laughs> the, the, the state of getting those frantic calls from Johnny in the middle of the night. Like there it's spring break. There's no receivers here. I don't have cleats, all of that. And then hearing Burkhart talk about catching passes yeah. in a private workout for an NFL team. And that NFL team still drafted his guy that, in the first round. That's the deal. And, and I saw what they were doing. So they had to cut my, my, I had the punchline to bring it all together, which was, yeah. And they still drafted him in classic Cleveland Browns fashion. And that in a nutshell, if you say, well, what happened in Cleveland and go, this guy at that time in his life got drafted by that franchise. Boom. Just like everyone feared, you know, I was hoping against hope, but the Cleveland Browns in, in that state and hell, I don't know, maybe their current state and, and, and Johnny Manziel in his state in 2013. And it was a match that never should have happened just based off of that, that workout. And I don't know how much of it got glossed over in, I think he was told me the other day, he was like, I wish he was like, I want to tell that version of the story because they were on the lake in Austin and they were supposed to, they were told you can't leave Austin after two 30. So coming from Austin to college station, PM, 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 okay. PM, have like some lead time that probably meant he was meeting with them. No later than six, if not five. And the Browns flew in, they were at, a nice country club, private room dinner or, or an early dinner. And he said they were on the lake and looked at the, the phone and it was four 30. Oh, and so they had to basically wrangle and scramble like you and I would do to get an Uber and get a private jet because that hour and 45 minute drive, hour and a half drive could not take an hour and a half. It Wait, they took a private jet from Austin to College Station. With all their buddies that had the jet. 80 miles all apart? Like a bunch of oil and gas buddies from West Texas that, that, that I think what? they were on the lake with. They flew it to College Station so it would only take, you know, 15, 20 minutes versus an hour and a half. <laughs> and so he goes to the dinner with the Browns. And then when I – so calls me like three, four times. It's a Friday night. It's Easter weekend. No one's in town. I'm like, I'm, I'm in bed watching TV, and they're wrapping up dinner. And I don't answer. I don't answer. I don't answer. Then he calls, or a girl calls that was at the dinner with him. I answer, 
<laughs> and it's him on the other line. He's like, why won't you? And I'm like, oh, God. And then I realize what's going on. I go, okay, I'm going to go over there. Little do I know Burkhart is there. Uh, you know, and, and we from there, we tried to kind of make sure everything went through. And that's when about one in the morning, you know, I'm wearing a, a big suite and I'm sleeping in on the couch. He comes out of the room and goes, hey, you know, we need to call. It was the A and M equipment manager. I said, uh -huh. one a.m., dude, on on Easter weekend. Like, I don't have we don't have footballs. I don't have shorts. I, I just have these, and they were like these. Like I don't even know what he was wearing. I was like, I don't, I don't have shorts. I don't have cleats. Luckily, you know, the equipment manager, the assistant equipment manager. I should give him a shout out. Brandon Moreau drove, left his. Woke up in the middle of the night, left his wife and kids, drove over there, laid all the stuff out for him for this like 7 a.m. Saturday morning workout. And then they get there and, oh, by the way, there's no receivers. Oh, my God. Well, those, yeah, and they yeah. still drafted him. You just encapsulated the Cleveland Browns. If you saw the I, – I didn't, I didn't get to see it. If you saw it, pictured those three, Burkhart, his lawyer, Brad, and, and his manager, Gareth, who's, you know, at the time – Barely older than Johnny. He just got done at TCU. He's probably like 20. 20. It's the first time somebody named Gareth has ever caught passes for NFL scouts. Gareth, Brad, and Eric. Can y'all go out there and catch passes for into this pro day workout? And uh, I think they were just doing like the tops of the routes, you know, and they were just yeah, running yeah. 10 feet and catching them. And, you know, and it was like the swing passes to the backs. And Johnny said he killed it. And like I said in the documentary, <laughs> I called think it was maybe eric maybe it was brad i called one of them and said how'd it go and they said you know uh it was a shit show it was awful and and they johnny's just on his way back to the lake i killed it and uh they said that and i'm like well the browns won't draft him and who knows maybe they would have drafted him with the ninth pick instead of but, they, and, but remember they traded up to 22 to get him that that just blows my mind when you hey, think about andy the thing that people i and i i don't know how documented it is it might be i might be saying something everybody knows but you know there was a team at the time good team they weren't great and and, and they had a really good veteran quarterback he wasn't probably a top 10 but he was really good by the name of alex smith coached mm -hmm. by andy reed <laughs> Chiefs. Oh and by all accounts uh -huh. and you could ask eb that and on down I'm, I, I we talked about i guess it, it didn't make the doc but you know eric burkhart or not andy reed and the chiefs where i think they were picking next if they weren't it was like two picks from now would they have pulled the trigger i don't know but by every account they were going to draft him in that spot so the kansas city chiefs would have drafted johnny Allegedly, and it's on enough authority that I do believe that was the case. And, and I know the Chiefs came. They, back they still would have drafted Mahomes because he would have flamed out by that point. But true. But they did. They also came back a second time, I think, for Johnny, uh, and were interested. And maybe that would have kept them from draft. I don't know. But you would laugh and you go, okay, the Pat Mahomes thing. There's some tie-ins to Johnny there, and one of them was that. But the other one is this, like. And I, I say timing, it was everything with Johnny. The timing at AM, you were there for it. Uh, Cliff, uh, and you're the one that said Johnny was a witch. At the time when I was doing the doc, I yeah, didn't Yeah, I know. made the documentary. I, I was shocked when I at saw it. At the time, that. I didn't know if I could drop names or anything. And I'm like, I don't want to throw staples into it. You know, and then and, and as I watched it the other night, I was like, why did I give? But that was your quote. Was yep. I look at you and you go, what did he say to you? And I told, I told him what you, what happened. You go, that dude's a damn witch, but it, the timing of A&M couldn't have been more perfect. Aggies were desperate to win. I, I went into it too. They, they were leaving the sec. It was or big 12 it was this hundred year decision. They were breaking away from Texas for all the money they were spending and the limb they were going out on, the last thing they wanted to do was be a laughing stock. You knew that. We, we talked about it a lot with you in our SEC Ready documentary. There was so much pressure, and here's this guy, Johnny Manziel. The timing was perfect for A&M. That offense was perfect for the SEC at that time. He was the perfect trigger man. Kingsbury was the perfect play caller. 
the perfect guy for Johnny. Sumlin had that swagger. It was it was the only way it could have worked for Johnny and AM and Sumlin and Cliff and everyone else. The timing couldn't have been worse. Think about them. how much money got made when you said how much money got made by other people. AM in terms of donations, mm -hmm. Kevin Sumlin, Cliff Kingsbury, who got his first head coaching job out of it, that, that he then parlayed into an NFL head coaching job. Yep. I mean, it is it's crazy what kind of revenue generator Johnny was in those two years. I mean, I would say, you know, more so than Cam Newton, more so than Tim T. But, you know, like everybody argues who's the, you know, Joe Burrow. Yeah. Burrow, but, you know, like those guys had better endings to the, you know, they won national titles. Cam Newton's one year was incredible. Burrow's one year might have been the best. But their um, schools but, didn't need that thing to happen right then. And they yeah. did. Yeah. And, and, and just the money. It would go Johnny and everybody else. When you talk about money generated, and, and it was, it was just this, it, it was really just this explosion that no one expected. I don't, yeah, obviously, he didn't expect it. AM didn't expect it. I did get one person text me, I thought AM was painted in a bad light. And no one else really felt that way. But their thing was, we put up the guardrails, Billy. You knew what the guardrails were. And my, Thought is this. Yes, it was 70 minutes. They could have gone into the whole AM side of it and, and and it would have sounded I didn't think AM came out sounding bad at all. I think it was understood that like, hey, could everyone have done better? Could Johnny, could you know, Paul, Sumlin, Cliff, the machine, um, even me as a friend, is there some way I could have I don't know. We all could have everyone, the whole thing, you know, is like you looked up. And he was out the door and it was like, man, that was fun. And then you go, uh oh. Yeah. You know, like, uh oh. Well, and, and, and I, I, and I, I lived that for the last 10 years. Like, you know, and that's why we've remained so close. It's like, we, you know, I, that dude is like, you know, this, he's like a little brother to me. Um, but my thing is the guardrails, sure, they were put up. And if people were in charge of guardrails and they didn't, and the guardrails didn't work, then there's blame to be shared there too. But everyone try. I will say, like, it, it all the people involved on the a and m side they they i do believe they tried their best and i think when you watch the documentary you get a get, i think it's not like an ant i don't think anything about it was anti a and m at all i think you get this <laughs> vibe of like man that must have been incredibly challenging for yes. everyone but no one more so and he did self sabotage i mean johnny takes the he, he i think he takes more of the blame even than he should but he did you know, if it would have been just not a personality like Johnny, none of that would have happened. And it would have been more like the storyline would have been, man, that guy, too bad he wasn't there for NIL. And it would have been as simple as that, right? Yeah. Well, the thing for – I believe Johnny says this in the doc. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he says basically it would not have mattered which NFL team drafted him. He was not ready to be an NFL quarterback at that time. Yeah. And I, I agree with that because you you look at where how he came out – and the way he he operated at Texas A and M was fine for that that moment, but would never work in the NFL. Like no no quarterback will ever succeed in the NFL handling it that way. You know, and it, the, everyone asks, oh, "Man, what about NIL? What about it?" I think the biggest thing about NIL with Johnny Manziel is he would have stayed one more year. A and M would have true. paid him God knows what. Might have been might have been more. more. He might have been able to make as much as he'd make as a first round draft pick. And he might have, yeah, and it, I, you're probably right. And he might have said, you know what, four losses this year. We went out losing to, you know, LSU and, and oh, I, that game I didn't play. I didn't play the way, you know, like he could have been a fully – to have one more year and go, this is my last shot. I want to be like a number one pick or the first quarterback picked or I want to, you know, get millions upon million. You know, you know I want to sign – you know, all those things I think – could have been like a care or it could have just been more of the same. We'll yeah. never know, but it, it would have, I think, given him a chance. And I think he would have gone down as quite possibly like the best college football player ever. If he would have, because remember all that stuff that year, Andy, all oh, of yeah. it, 
NCAA. Yeah, in the NIL era, none of that happens. Like, and he was a top five Heisman finalist. Yeah, the, the, and, the business he and Uncle Nate were running is perfectly allowed now. Right, it's crazy. And you, and you, 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 could, you could do that with no problems. Yeah, and with all that drama and all that partying and the craziness and the distraction, and he was a Heisman finalist, and I think against Bama and Auburn, who played for the title that year, I think he had like nine, I think definitely over 800, if not closer to 900 yards of offense and about seven or eight touchdowns. I mean, yeah. it's. Well, I, was, cool. I was at that Bama game, you know, where, where Mike yep. Evans was, was just going off. And it, My. another year would have been really interesting. Him, him in college in 2014, because remember, that's when Alabama started Blake Sims at quarterback. Uh, Auburn and Ole Miss and Mississippi State were really, really good. That would have been a crazy SEC West, if you think yeah. about it. It would have. And so, I, you know, it would have. And then the other thing is he probably wouldn't have got drafted by the Browns. We'd give him a little more shot. I always thought Johnny needed to go to a team, the Saints, with Sean Brady Taylor. and Sean Payton, the Patriots with Brady and Belichick, the, the, the Chiefs with Alex Smith, and and Andy Reid somewhere where he knew he wasn't going to play, but also a real franchise and organization where he just felt this real desire that I don't want to disappoint this head coach. I can't sit in a meeting room with Drew Brees and Tom Brady. Like I can't not work in front of these guys. I can't come in here hung like because he is. He is like that. If he would have been in the right situation, even I think at that age, not to say it would have worked, but it would have been a million times better. My other point, though, you look at the league now. Um, you look over there, at, you know, who won the Super Bowl two years ago with the Los Angeles Rams as a head coach. Um, you look McVay. at McVay, you look at Cliff Kingsbury as a head coach in the NFL, or he was. Um, Patrick Mahomes and the way he plays. Baker Mayfield, Johnny. Wilson out of BYU, I believe, said he, you know, grew up watching him. These guys, Mahomes, Kyler, Wait, and maybe Peyton. not the best set of examples, except for Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> this, is true. this is true. But Kyler's been to Pro Bowls. Baker's, yes. you know, won playoff games. My point is, you're so right, though. But my point is the style of play in quarterbacks and coaches is where the default is moving to in the NFL. Yeah. And it came yeah. right after him. Not to say that. You know, he would have had to have been clean and committed. You're right. No yeah. quarterback. Will ever I, I'm just not sure. Like, it, it's interesting hearing, yeah. like, from his sister, who always seemed to be kind of a very level headed person in his life. When she says, even now, I don't know if he's going to be able to ever live a normal life. Like, that part made me very sad to hear. Mm. I, but it also makes me wonder if it ever would have worked out as a football player. Maybe just yeah, he wasn't destined to be a, a good NFL player. There's too much that goes into the, the, the preparation. And it did. Like he said in the doc, it came easy to him, college football, which very few people can ever say that to achieve that level of success to say it came easy to me. He was as talented as anyone I've seen, you know, come out of Texas, the, the, Adrian Peterson's, the Roy Williams, the Vince Young's, and, and that's, you know, that's at the very top of the list. You know, Des Bryant, there's so many, I, I don't even know where to begin. You've got so many NFL quarterbacks, you know, Matt Stafford, Drew Brees, Nick Foles, I'm naming, you know, yeah, yeah. Super Bowl quarterbacks here. Uh, Jalen Hurts, I just named like four Super Bowl, but Johnny from a football talent. He doesn't have the arm. He doesn't throw like Matt said. You know, there, I, you go up and down. But from a football talent, that dude was there with like Peterson and Vince. And, but he, you know, he was under six foot. He wasn't built for it like some of those guys we mentioned were. But more than anything, you know, yeah, you look at all those guys I named and the majority of them have famous, famous work ethics, you know. Uh, and And look. We you mentioned Kyler Murray earlier. That would be one of the guys who I would put up there right alongside Johnny and Vince. Maybe even better. Kyler Maybe Kyler better. may be the Never most lost. athletically gifted of all of these people. Never lost. And and yep. and that skill set and that and he did, he did pattern a lot after Johnny and watched him and came to AM after him and uh talked to Johnny, I think, on the day he committed and so but 
again, people are questioning they're in Arizona, the work ethic and things like that. And it's just, you know, and, and I think with Johnny and Kyler, guys like that, when, when you're giving up something in, in Kyler's case, it's pretty much simply size, kind of the same with Johnny. You have to make up for it. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to make up for it somehow. And, and I know in Johnny's case, he wasn't ready to put in what it would have taken to make up for it. So how do you, how do you think Johnny feels post doc and uh, now, now that everybody's seen and it feels like he was pretty open how did he yeah. feel about it about the documentary he feels we talked he feels great he was really he was really i think he was really worried how it was going to come out and he didn't watch it until very recently like i think he, at one point he had asked me if i'd seen it but i said no i mean have you he said no i said what you know and he was i think he was just worried what how it was going to come out from other people's sides because he didn't bother to find out what anybody else said he didn't go around asking so he didn't know what Aaron or Aaron said or what uncle nate said or any of that he never we never asked me anything he didn't ask me you know it's one thing to say hey did you say anything crazy it's gonna make me look but i'm like he didn't say any of that he didn't ask me what did they ask you he had no interest he just he knew he sat down with him he knew what he said he was comfortable with that but i think he knew that he kind of you know, bared his soul a little bit. And so I think he was like, I wonder how that's going to be received. I don't think he felt like he was going to go out there and burn anybody. He wasn't worried about that. I think he was more like, how am I going to be received? Which all of us would be that way. And, and then I think he was kind of like, man, I don't know what everybody else will say, you know, in terms of he didn't want to make A&M look bad. He didn't want to make his family look bad or himself, you know, or himself. He didn't really, Care about yeah, it didn't seem he, he cared about uh, making himself look bad. You, he did he a few did. times, yeah, yeah, and he didn't, and 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 that was, I think, what he was like. Like, man, I wonder how I'm going to be perceived. You know, just like you or I or anyone would be if you just said, "Hey, I'm just going to sit in front of a camera and tell all to the world, um, good, bad, and the ugly." But afterwards, you know, I think he's really, I think for the first time, Andy, in a long time, I think there's like. Uh, and I hope he can capitalize on it. There's like a positive momentum to him. And there's always been popularity and there's always been intrigue and interest. But I think now there's like a positive momentum to him and his, and his brand. And I know he didn't, you know, he, like you said, sometimes he said things that made him come off bad and he knew it, you know, he was like, yeah, yeah, this is what it was. But I think when you, that thing ends, like I think he realizes he's got support the needle is, you know, all the way on tilt again. And people understand him, I think, a little more. And now he if he, you know, if he does the right things from a business standpoint and it makes the right moves, I think he could really capitalize on it. And I've got a multiple, multiple ways I think he should. And I think number one of them is to go speak. You know, I see AM and Alabama and Clemson, Ohio State, everybody pays these guests, Rice, you know, whoever. They pay these speakers to come in and talk to the kids. Who better to have an impact than – and and unfortunately, if if this would have been out three months ago, you've seen his Heisman speech. You saw him on the dock. You know, kids in those things, they pull their hoodies on after practice and they're doing this half the time. And for Johnny to go in there and say, hey – that's that was me. They'd be and paying I attention. For I sure. didn't look to Chris Heron or what, what, what was his name? The, the yeah, boss. Chris Heron is the yeah, he, he came I in and did all those. Yeah, yeah, I didn't listen to Chris Heron when he told me how he was on the street corner buying drugs before Celtics games. I didn't listen to that. I was looking at my phone, I was worried about whatever girl I was dating at the time. And and now I was where you are then, and I'm where I am now. So hear me out. You know, like who can have a more powerful message? I think in 2023 or even next summer, 2024, to kids yeah. that are in college football than Johnny football, and especially in the wake of this doc. And you know how much those guys are paid that are good. Yeah. And then you go into the whole other one where you speak to, you know, at corporate events. So you just go go do two speeches and he would kill them and then do that. And man, I mean, that's just that's just one of about a hundred little side things I think he could do. I think he could do TV, like, you know, at a, at a desk, I think. So, anyway, he just needs to be in a place where he just commits and says, okay, let's do this. I think yeah. 
time for him. Got, got to show up. That's that's the only thing. So that is that is. So, Billy Lucci, you showed up. The Netflix famous Billy Lucci from Texags. <sighs> Thanks so much. I'm still disappointed I didn't say. And and the one and only Andy Staples turns to me <laughs> and says, "I I I am okay with it because I knew it was me." <laughs> That is Billy Lucci. Those are cra crazy stories about Johnny Menzel that were in the documentary, some of them, and then the behind the scenes of some of the documentary stuff, like getting a private jet from Austin to College Station, which are 100 miles apart. 100 miles apart. He needed to get a private jet or he was going to miss a dinner with the Browns, and that would have kept him from getting drafted in the first round. It's craziness craziness that's like a by the way like it's eight minute flight it's that it, it's nothing but go watch the doc if you haven't already seen it it is a a really interesting portal into the mind of johnny manzel and you get a lot of just backstage drama from everything that was happening and the other side of some stories that were big in 2013 2012 that, that maybe didn't didn't realize for the extra point tonight though there's NFL preseason on our televisions right now. The, the Texans are playing the Patriots right now. And as a college football fan, I really do enjoy NFL preseason games because sometimes it's, it's maybe the last chance I'm going to get to see a guy I love playing in college because he might be in a camp this year. He might get cut and we might not see him play football again. But also seeing the NFL people discover the guys that we love. Uh, you've seen Trace McSorley on the screen now. He is currently playing for the Patriots He's their quarterback at the moment. Tank Dell tonight. The NFL people now being introduced to Tank Dell. We watched him at Houston and loved him. Used to see him catching touchdown passes from Clayton Toon. Well, tonight we saw Tank Dell make a circus catch for a touchdown. And now all the NFL people are buzzing. Well, we already knew about him. He was ours first. We knew him when he was playing small coffee shops. But this is one of my favorite parts of the NFL preseason, just seeing these guys show what they can do to a different audience, to, to a group that maybe hasn't seen them do it yet. And Tank Dell, you're going to be the breakout. Everybody will be talking about you on Friday morning. We will be talking. But on Sunday night, we'll be back. Sonny Dykes from TCU will be our guest. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>